avec deux, avec deux autrices absolument extraordinaires. Donc, je vous présente euh, Souvankam Tamavongsa et Mai Dervang. Euh, Souvankam Tamavongsa qui publie chez nous en français le magnifique recueil de nouvelles « Le cas ne se prononce pas euh, », le titre en anglais « How to pronounce knife ». Souvent Kam est né en 1978 dans un camp de réfugiés laotiens en Thaïlande et elle est poète et romancière. Elle a publié trois recueils de poésie, un premier livre de nouvelles, donc « How to pronounce knife »,« Le cas ne se prononce pas », que nous avons euh, l'honneur de traduire dans la traduction magnifique de Véronique Lessard. Et Véronique Lessard, la traductrice de « Le cas ne se prononce pas » est présente avec nous aujourd'hui. Bonjour Véronique, merci d'être ici avec nous. Um, et donc, euh, on sera en, euh, souvent comme sera en conversation avec Mai Dervang, Mai Dervang qui est poète, euh, née et élevée à Fresno en Californie. Um, et Mai Dervang publie son tout premier recueil de poésie, euh, Afterland, euh, dans la traduction en français L'après-pays, dans une traduction de Marc Charon, Marc Charon. Uh, qui est un collaborateur très précieux à Mémoire d'Encrier et qui a publié aussi, qui a traduit chez nous aussi uh, « Ciel de nuit blessé par balle uh, » de uh, Ocean Vang. Uh, « L'après-pays », c'est aussi le premier livre de Maider Vang qui lui a valu le prix Walt Whitman. « Le cas ne se prononce pas » a reçu le prix le plus prestigieux au Canada, le Giller, le 2020. Donc, nous sommes vraiment ravis Uh, d'avoir ces deux femmes extraordinaires avec nous. Uh, et déjà, commençons donc par la poésie et par la lecture. Je cède la parole à Véronique et à Marc pour nous donner un petit goût de ces deux livres magnifiques. Merci. Le soir du bal de l'école est arrivé. James avait fait sa première cueillette à peine quelques semaines plus tôt mais c'était comme si ça faisait toute une vie. Tant de choses avaient changé et j'étais déroutée. Je connaissais James, le patron à la ferme, et je connaissais James, le garçon de 14 ans avec qui j'allais à l'école. Deux personnes différentes. Au travail, j'épiais sa froideur nouvelle, attendant qu'elle se change en autre chose, comme on attend d'être aimé, d'être reconnu comme quelqu'un à aimer. Je n'ai pas épié ce visage trop longtemps, car je n'aime pas ce que je voyais. Et peut-être que ce que je voulais voir n'avait jamais été là. Le soir du bal, ma mère a mis sur mon lit la robe rose que je devais porter. Elle serait sortie quand il arriverait. Elle serait une soirée de cartes. Je ne vais pas te dire ce que tu dois faire, comment vivre ta vie, a-t-elle dit. Vas-y si tu veux aller avec lui au bal de l'école. Mais je ne veux pas être là quand il arrivera. Tu sais comment je me sens par rapport à ça. Je ne peux pas être gentille, ce n'est pas moi. Mais toi, tu as une chance dans cette vie. Ramasse tes verres et quitte la ville. Sois gentil. James est arrivé seul. Il était vêtu d'un smoking noir, les cheveux lissés vers l'arrière et portait des chaussures noires qui claquaient sur le bitume. Il avait dans la main un truc rose qui pendouillait. Une fleur. J'avais éteint toutes les lumières. On aurait dit qu'il n'y avait personne à la maison. Le réverbère faisait comme un projecteur. Je voyais la pelouse avant et quand il est entré dans la lumière, j'ai aperçu son visage en entier. Petit au début, puis de plus en plus grand, son front bombant vers l'avant. Il a sonné, puis sonné à nouveau. Quand, après quelques minutes, je n'avais toujours pas ouvert, il s'est mis à frapper sur la porte et à se débattre avec la poignée mais c'était fermé à clé. Il s'est tiré les cheveux qui sont devenus dépeignés, ébouriffés, ahuris. J'ai tout vu de l'autre côté de la porte, dans l'obscurité, l'observant par le cercle doré du Judas. Je n'ai rien fait, même pas quand je l'ai entendu sangloter. J'ai posé un doigt sur le Judas et je l'ai laissé là. Je ne voulais pas qu'il voie mon œil ouvert. The evening of the school dance came. 
although it had only been a few weeks since James first came picking with us, it felt like a lifetime. So much had changed and become confusing to me. I knew James as boss out at the farm, and I knew James as the 14-year-old boy I went to school with. They seemed like different people. When I was at work, I would watch him, waiting for his newfound coldness to turn into something else, the way one waits to be loved, to be recognized as someone to be loved. I didn't look at that face too long because I didn't like what I saw. And maybe what I wanted to see had never been there. The night of the dance, my mother laid out the pink dress I was supposed to wear on my bed. She wasn't going to be home when he came. She would be out at a card party. I'm not going to tell you what to do, how to live your life, she said. You go on now if you want to go with him to that school dance. But I don't want to be here when he gets here. You know how I feel about it. I can't be nice about it all. It's just not in me. But you... You've got a chance in this life. Pick those worms and get out of this town. Be nice. James arrived alone. He was dressed in a black tuxedo, hair slicked back, and wearing black shoes that clicked on the concrete. He had in his hand a pink thing that flopped, a flower. I had turned out all the lights. It looked like no one was home. The street lamp was like a spotlight. I could see the front lawn, and when he walked into the light, I could see his whole face. It was small at first, and then it got bigger, his forehead looming closer. He rang the doorbell, then he rang it again. When after a few minutes, I still did not open the door, he started banging and struggled to turn the knob but it was locked. He grabbed and pulled at his own hair and it came loose and wild and undone. I saw it all standing on the other side of the door in the dark, watching him in the golden circle that framed the peephole. I did nothing, not even when I heard him sob. I pressed a finger up to the peephole and held it there. I did not want him to see my open eye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Veronique and uh, Souvan Kam. Now I'd like to uh, invite Marc to read an excerpt of La Prépayie Afterland. Merci, Ara. Uh, thank you so much, Souvan Kam and uh, Veronique for, that, uh, for those readings. Um, my dear, um, this is how your poetry sounds in French. Um, this is, uh, donc, uh, deux, je vous lirai dans un premier temps, uh, deux poèmes tirés de La Prépayie, Afterland, dans sa version originale. Ce premier poème s'intitule Sépulture d'eau. Sépulture d'eau. Nous traversons sous le bouclier de minuit puis apprenons que les balles peuvent maudire l'air. Une assemblée d'étoiles en, en danger s'évince pour gagner l'eau. Un autre convoi quitte la chaleur de la touraille. Les morts, encombrés, se muent en draps que déplie la terre. Nous dérivons près des, des berges, créatures du Mekong, têtes bondissant comme des fantômes sans corps, vers la rive la plus lointaine. Avec chaque pas, mouillé, les jambes embourbées, nous nous implorons de vivre, de flotter sur le cartilage passé au mortier et sur le linceul qui est devenu cette cour rivière de cœurs amputés. Ensuite, le deuxième poème euh, que je vous <coughs> lis à l'instant s'intitule « Pluie jaune ». Enfin, j'en profite aussi pour dire que « Pluie jaune »,« Yellow rain » en anglais, euh, dont dira peut-être quelques mots Maïdervan, euh, est aussi le titre du prochain recueil de Maïdervan euh, en anglais qui sera publié euh, au mois de septembre euh, chez son éditeur Grey Wolf. Euh, donc, 
il y a dans ce premier recueil, la papille, un poème intitulé « Pluie jaune » que je vous lis à l'instant. « Pluie jaune. D'abord, le nez qui brûle, puis les yeux, où une fournaise s'embrase afin, afin de creuser ton visage. Moucheron au-dessus des orbites vides, ta peau déchirée par les asticots. Une autre vache meurt en respirant l'air même que tu as avalé. Combien de jours avant qu'il te rende gris comme l'hiver au cœur de cette jungle transformée en cimetière de fortune? Combien d'heures avant les lésions, avant que ton vomi durcisse le plancher de terre? Quelque part, une maison vieillie au froid, non plus réchauffée par le foyer que tu entretenais jadis. Personne n'allume de billets funéraires. Personne ne scande le chemin. Thank you so much for that reading in French, Mark. And thank you um, to Yada and um, to Rodney for the work um, to put these books together. I'm thrilled to be here um, reading alongside Suvan Kam, who is a writer who I've long admired. Um, and thank you all for being here as well. So the first poem I'm going to read um, in collaboration with Mark is Watergrave. Watergrave. <clears throat> we cross under the midnight shield and learn that bullets can curse the air. A symposium of endangered stars evicts itself to the water. Another convoy leaves the kiln. The crowded dead turn into the earth's unfolded bedsheet. We drift near banks, creatures of the Mekong, heads bobbing like ghosts without bodies toward the farthest shore. With every treading soak, the waiting leg, we beg ourselves to live, to float the mortared cartilage and burial tissue in this river yard of amputated hearts. And the second poem um, is titled Yellow Rain. And um, it just so happens too that I have a, a full, a, my second collection of poetry is coming out uh, this uh, September from Grey Wolf Press um, and uh, is a much deeper, more expansive exploration into this topic of yellow rain, which was a, an, an alleged biological chemical weapon that um, was used against the Hmong um, following the US uh, conflict in Vietnam. So here it is, yellow rain. First, the sting in your nose. Then in your eyes, a furnace flared to hollow your face. Flies above your empty sockets. Maggots made your split skin. Another cow dies from breathing as you swallowed from the same air. How many days before it wintered you gray in this wilderness turned makeshift graveyard? How many hours before the lesions, before your vomit hardens the earthen floor, somewhere a house ages cold, no longer warmed by the hearth you once tended. No one lights any spirit money, no one chants the way. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, that was such a beautiful reading, Miter. Um, I wanted to ask you if that was the first time that you heard your poetry read in French and, and, and how that might have felt like for you to hear that. So the short answer is yes, that is the first time. Um, and um, just the short excited answer is yes. Um, and yeah, it's so interesting to hear your work read in another language. You know, as a as a Hmong American, I you know, and 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 as someone who 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 does read and and speak and sometimes try to write in Hmong, you know, I I do think about my work of uh, how it might behave linguistically or how it might sort of interact um, uh, in other languages, and 
to hear it in French was so different because uh, because uh, the, the sounds were so interesting and so um, you know the cadence and what I hear in the English uh, comes through differently in the French, but not you know but in a really new and different way, which makes my ears perk up differently when I hear see the words on the page and then hear Mark reading it as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of older Laotians um, don't know how to read or write in, um, in English, but they do know French. And so for me, um, this is the language in which they will, you know, first understand these stories. Um, and finally, I feel like the older generation will understand uh, what I've been doing with this book, because there's been questions like, what is this book? Um, um, what are these stories? I don't understand them. But now that it's available in French, um, they they can understand it and they can come to it and see what what we've been talking about for a whole year. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, is, is writing, difficult for you? Yeah, I, um, so I'll, I'll answer that question too. And then I, I have questions to ask you as well, because I have so much, I'm curious to learn. Um, and um, for me, yeah, I, I think with, um, I think any writer would be, would be silly to say that it's easy, <laughs> because it's, it's not easy. And um, it's, I mean, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you, you can get a good polished poem on the first try, um, but you know, for me, I'm I'm a very slow writer, like many writers are. I, I I I'm I'm quite tedious in how I put together my lines, and sometimes for me, even just coming up with the first line of that poem is already doing most of the work already. Because for me, if I can get that first line, then I know that the rest of the lines will come. And so I spend, um, I spend days, I think I would say, you know, several days trying to, um, to sort of listen for the words and to be very in tuned and pay attention to what it is that I'm trying to sort of express. Sometimes I don't know what will come out, you know, like with writing, we don't know, we can't plan for what the poem wants to do. We can't plan for the words that will come into it. And, um, and so, so there's an openness that challenges me to sort of, you know, um, just allow what comes through to be able to come through and not sort of force it too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious to know, because you write poetry and you, and then you had this sort of stunning collection of short stories, you know? And so you're navigating these two very um, diver dynamic sort of genres of writing. What's the process for you like in terms of writing fiction? Um, is it dim different or similar to writing poetry for you? Or how do you engage in those processes similarly or differently? Um, I think of... Um fiction and poetry as just forms, um, the way that an artist might only work with the color blue or cement or plastic, my material is words. Um, so whether it's fiction or poetry or an essay or a memoir, I know that the material I have is, is words and, and sentences. And I think of these these other forms as um, houses or dwellings. And, and I respect the house that I walk into. I know who lives there. Um, and I know how to behave in each of those houses. Yeah, um, oh, that's so interesting. Um, I, I, I so admire prose writers who can take sentences and make them long and expansive over a book. You know, and when I think of poetry, I think of like, you know, short spurts of language. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm always in awe of prose writers. Well, well speaking of all, like all these dwellings, um, I'm wondering why, why you chose poetry? 
Yeah, poetry for me. Um, so I started writing poetry when I was fairly young, probably when I was about 10 or 11. And when I started writing poetry, it was really, um, it, it, you know, it, it was really just to be able to, to write something that was for my friends. You know, you write poetry, you're often writing to share to your friends or to give out. And it was really, you know, I, I think I tell people a lot that it was really like roses are red, violets are blue, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there was something about the way that you could use words to, um, to, you know, to express yourself, obviously, right, to express yourself. And then it wasn't until much later in my undergraduate studies when I, you know, when I went to college that I was then able to really study poetry and see within it so much dexterity of form and, mm -hmm. and so much ability to, um, to take a, to take English, which was, you know, what, what I was, what I write in, um, but to be able to take English and almost kind of twist and warp it to, to, on my terms, to my terms, you know, mm -hmm. and then through that, I can, I can, I can put, I can, I can, I can, I sort of deconstruct the syntax of the line, or I can, I can change up the diction and use it in a way that might be inappropriate, you know, or really be fun with it. And I know that didn't help Mark, <laughs> you know, those are some of the reasons why the translation was, was such a trek, I imagine. But that's why I think I love, I love being able to use poetry because there is that dexterity of experimentalism and freedom that you can ex explore when you when you create new words or you you compound words together or you position them on the page in a way that shows their relationship um so so i think that's why i've, I've always been so fascinated by poetry not even just by my poetry but by the work of other poets as well what well, well what happened to that first poem that you wrote that first, the first poem for this book. <laughs> I, no, the first poem that you, that, oh. you know, that you were talking about how it's like roses are red, violets. Oh red. yeah, I mean we all wrote poems <laughs> like that. You know, we all, you you probably do. <laughs> but, I, you know, I would you, never admit to it. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I know, right? But I'm I'm okay. You know, like you know, I mean that's, and that's where I think I think I think that's where. Um, you know, having been born in a, into a Hmong refugee family, that was sort yeah. of my first avenue. My ability mm -hmm. to access poetry was through being able to use it as a way to relate and to mm -hmm. express. And from there, that's when it, when it was able to grow. Um, so no, those poems are not anywhere in existence. I mean, I don't even, I probably don't, ha I mean, I don't have copies of those poems anymore, but, um, but I really like. I think for me, it was something. It was writing has always been something that um, has been with me, even as a child. Um, but now I'm curious to know from you, like you know, we're talking about about our sort of origin stories of writing, and I, I would be curious to know what writing advice would you have given, or would you give to the younger version of yourself? And I mean, mm. yeah, I just. I, I think I would tell myself that you only get to see all of this once, remember everything. Um, and I probably tell myself, don't ask for advice. You already know what's fantastic, um, what lit good literature feels like when you come across it as a reader and use that as your guide. Um, I don't like asking for advice, you know, from anyone. Um, because I think when I'm asking for advice, I'm putting what I know and love and what excites me aside. And, and, and I'm asking someone to define for me who and what I should be. So I, I really don't myself like to ask for advice or even to give it, but just thinking of myself as a, as a kid, um, you know, I think about like the first day that I walked in, into kindergarten and I knew then that 
I had had more education than my parents just by walking into that room. So I think for me, the hardest part was, was to learn all the language, the English language um, by myself, to have no one except the teacher and my classmates um, to tell me um, that what I was doing was wrong or to correct me. And, and, and to go home and, and to bring that knowledge um, and to give that to my parents. Um, uh, you know, that's who I think of or whatever advice um, I'm thinking of giving to myself. I always think back to that kid I was. And I want to say, you know, you will see all of this just once in this lifetime. So just, you know, try to remember everything. So when you get older, you can write about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's great advice. That <laughs> <laughs> you just said you don't, yeah, you don't get advice, but that's great advice, actually. Um, I want to talk about those stories because everything that you just said right now, I think was somehow embodied in each one of those stories that came out in, in the book. And the, the one that you just read, um, Picking Worms, um, you know, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your thought and how you formulated these stories, whether, um, you know, writing them or sort of thinking through them conceptually or coming up with them and, and how you, what you drew from? I drew from my life experience, my own feelings. Um, I thought about my parents really and my family. Often when we hear about refugees and immigrants, they've done something fantastic, like start up a donut store and made a million dollars. Um, but you know, your life is as valuable too, if that hasn't happened to you. Um, for me, I was thinking of the jobs that nobody wants and that my parents have worked. Um, you know, um, it doesn't mean because they work these jobs, it doesn't mean that they're lazy or unintelligent. Um, I tried when I write, when I was writing stories about the nail salon or picking worms or the chicken processing plant to try to tell readers that these jobs are incredibly difficult um, and there's a beauty and an integrity there. Um, I value work so much in whatever form it comes. Um, I want, I love the idea that you arrive to a place every day and there's a spot for you um, to contribute. Um, and um, it doesn't matter what you do, it's who you are um, that you bring to the job. Um, like the woman who picks worms. Um, it's a really hard job and she figures out ways to, to gather all these worms and um, all these methods, the way that, you know, a writer might think, well, I'm gonna write a poem, a short story, a memoir. Um, she makes those kinds of decisions um, and she's fantastic at what she does, but she gets passed over for, for, for what she contributes and how valuable she is to the job. But that's not all that the story's about um, for me. I mean, I've heard reviewers talk about privilege because, you know, a young man ends up taking her job. But for me, the power of that story is the young girl who has the power to say no, who, who doesn't open the door. Um, for me, that is the star of the story. Um, and, you know, I've off, um, as, we, as I was reading the story, it occurred to me just saying, um, you know, the, the idea of being nice. Um, I wanted a, like a girl, a main character who is not nice to give permission for ourselves or people like us that we don't, we can make decisions and we don't have to be nice. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I think the, the, the young girl in that story definitely, um, you know, has such a profound role in, in, and, and, and in doing, in having that role in which she sort of just is able to, um, 
to mediate that situation so well, um, she really does then demonstrate her sense of agency, right? You know, mm -hmm. and having that agency um, is so is so meaningful um, in that situation. So wow, yeah. I, I there's one thing that I hate so much um, to be on the receiving end, and that's pity. Um, it's such an awful feeling. Um, so I never pity my characters, even when they're down and out. And I never prove or try to prove that any of my characters um, are human or human beings, I assume it. That has been for me the, the important part um, of the work. Um, what's coming to mind to me at this moment is a line from one of your poems. Um, my dare you write, to meet the end is to go back through every dwelling. And I found myself doing that when I reached the end of your book. Like I, I thought of each page as a dwelling and it made me go back and want to be in it again. Um, I think ending are so difficult to get to, especially in books. And I know you've talked a little bit about not planning, planning. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, but did you plan this ending? Um, and how did you know that when you got to the end that, okay, I'm, I, the book is finished? Like, how did you get to that moment? Yeah, that's a great question for this particular book. Um, so the book is broken into multiple sections and it ends on the, 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 the sort of the title poem, Afterland. Um, and that's the line, the line I think you're quoting yeah. is from one of the sections yeah. in Afterland. And, you know, for me, I think that, um, well, first of all, I did not anticipate that Afterland was going to end up at the end of the book, you know, and as, as you, you know, with poetry, um, you know, you sort of write the poems and you think about, you know, as you're as you're sort of assembling it into a collection, you're thinking about, well, what are what are the what are the gaps that I'm missing in this collection or what are the what are the perspectives or the aesthetics or the or the particular particularities of it that are still missing and that for me, I think that um, when I was arranging and assembling the order of the poems, it just felt like Afterland was calling itself to be the last piece, mm -hmm. even though it's a little, um, I wouldn't say it's risky, but it, it's, it's, it's a little bold to end on a longer piece, right? Because you've already taken your reader through your whole collection and then to end on something quite long like Afterland. Um, just require a bit of a <clears throat> of a risk, but um, for me, I think that um, you know uh, the putting that poem at the end meant also that um, that I was helping the reader or sort of taking the reader through um, a journey to kind of revisit the poems that came before. The poem Afterland too is based. Um, well, actually, writing the whole book was based on myself, you know, growing up again in a refugee family, but also growing up in a family that practice, practices shamanism. And so um, for funeral, you know, when we have funerals, um, they tend to be, they're very elaborate. They don't, they don't tend to be, I'm sorry, but they are very elaborate and they're, um, they're sort of immersed within ritual and ceremony. And one of the, one of the activity, one of the key activities that has to happen during every ceremony is this chant called showing the way. Mm -hmm. And what you do in this chant is that the chanter um, has to chant the life of the person who has deceased. And they're chanting all the way from the current point and going backwards in time. And so that line that you cited um, to meet the end is to go back through every dwelling was rooted in that idea mm -hmm. that, that in that moment of our life's finality, we will, um, we, will, we will go backwards to visit, revisit all the cities that we've lived in, all the places that our footsteps have walked through, um, all, of the, all of the sort of locations on this, on this planet that our, our spirit has had the chance to interact with and remember all of that, 
you know, into our next life. And so that's where that line, just to answer your question about that particular line, that's where it comes from. But, but for me, I do think of these poems each as their own dwelling in and of itself as well. Um, and the way that, the way that, um, each of those dwellings is a container for our memory, right? Um, and, 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 and the poems I sometimes think of as containers and rooms in and of themselves too. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but for me, like, I think that, I think that seeing these poems like this and um, being able to revisit them like that is, 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 is you know, is, it feels, it feels like I'm, like, I'm, I, you know, feels, it feels spiritual for me, but it feels like I'm wanting to transcend what the page can offer as well by thinking about them as rooms, as containers, as dwellings. Um, yeah. So I, I know, I, go ahead. I feel so lucky to like read a line like that and, and get to ask the author herself, you know, um, if, you know, how did you get to that? Or how do you do this? Um, thank you for for um, talking about it so beautifully. That was a great example of a line that you draw you drew out too. So thank you for for just being so uh, diligent in your <laughs> in your your reading of it. So I think we well, might be are we are we kind of short on time? Well, I I wondered if I could just squeeze in one more question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, like. My dear, I, I view you as, um, as successful. You achieve literature to me. Um, I'm, but, you know, success can also be personal. And I'm wondering, what is success to you? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to turn that question back on you, too, in just a minute. But I'm going to give a very quick response. I think success for me is just you know we can we can think about the literal idea of success right being able to write a book and publish it and have yeah. people read it right that's the you know that's that's great you know just 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 for someone to want to read my book is success right um but i think for me as a writer um the success that i'm i i you know or just 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 the the hope that i have for myself as i continue to write is that i continue to allow myself to be open to the surprises that language can offer me that i'm not afraid to challenge myself and take the kinds of creative risk to help um to sort of open up my writing in ways that i might not have ever thought to do before and afterland helped me get you know, in, in, into a point in my writing that I'd never thought I'd get. And so I think for me, like, that's my hope. My, my hope is just to continue to allow myself to be open to what the work wants and to be attentive to it and to be, um, to, to sort of nurture my creativity and, and to allow myself to be, um, to be open to those kinds of surprises. Um, if I can do that much as a writer and continue to to uh, support that in my writing, then I'll, then I'll be happy, you know, and, um, and, and, and success can also mean that, you know, that I'm able to, um, to support other writers along the way, um, you know, writers who, who may not have had the chance yet to really get poems out there, or, um, you know, that would also be meaningful for me is to be able to, to support other writers, whether they're, um, you know, writers that have been just historically underrepresented or um, writers who have had a long history of just not getting any traction, um, but have meaningful stories and, and poems to tell. Um, I think that would also be success for me. And I just would love to hear from you too, what your, your idea of success would be for you. Um, I'm in agreement with you that you know, to the reading public and to some writers in their infancy or, or to just some writers, um, success is seen in terms of having a book um, and also um, the acknowledgement from peers or, or the crowning of a prize or someone else's say so. For me, success is the moment when there is no prize, the moment when um, no one else sees how hard it is to sit down and get to the page, 
how hard it is to hear someone say that's not a living or how hard it is to write poetry for 25 years and to have somebody say, is it in English? <laughs> um, you know, uh, so for me, success is to move through those moments and to get to the book um, and, and, and to be able to know what to do when my editor says, can you open up a scene here? <laughs> Like, you know, like you really have to know what to do because that's so vague. And if you don't know how to open up a scene, like that's on you. Um, and, and when your book goes out, you can have a great editor, a great team. But when your book goes out, that's your face. And, and, and that's who has to answer for what's on the page. Um, and, it, you know, for me, if, if the book is, is as I want it. I can hold that face forward um, with pride and, and, and confidence and certainty. And to get to that point, I find um, is very difficult. Um, if, yeah. are, there, are there questions that you know, yeah. the audience might wanna ask us or shall we end on a reading? I'm not really sure. There's a there's a question from uh, uh, your French editor, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, first thank you for this wonderful conversation. We can listen to you forever. It's amazing. Um, uh, so the question is, and I'll try to translate into English. How does your uh, how does your your country of origin or your origins or background haunt your writing? How did you find, where, had, where have you found the memory of that country of before or of that land of before? Mm. Sorry for the really bad um, <laughs> For me, it doesn't. I have no memory because I was born in a refugee camp. My parents, I left the country that I'm supposed to be from in the stomach, you know, in my mom's womb. So I have no memory except what they tell me and my parents don't talk about that time. So for me, I think my country of origin is the country I grew up in and have lived in my whole life, which is Canada. Um, I see myself as a Canadian writer. Um, to me, a Lao writer is somebody who lives in, La in Laos, who writes in the Lao language. I write in the English language. Um, so I view myself as the origin, you know, uh, as my country of origin is the country that I live in. Mm -hmm. How about you, my, my dear? Sort of similar to Sivankam too. Um, I, um, so my parents, they, they resettled um, in the United States in the very early 80s. And I was born right around the time that they were resettled. Um, I think like Yusuf Vankam, I was probably in my mother's tummy as well. Um, and and it, it, you know, it, it would have just been a matter of like maybe six months to a year. If they hadn't resettled, then I would have been born in the refugee camp. Um, and for me, I think um, I think because I don't have the memory of what it of the of that of the country in the way that my parents have the memory of it. Um, what, what haunts me is the absence of it. You know, the absence of that memory is really, I think, and I, and I find that with a lot of these poems, that's kind of what I keep grasping towards is, the, is this thing that I don't know anything about, this thing that doesn't have a shape or form to it. And yet here I am trying to sort of wrangle it into these poems. And, and I think that's what will continue to sort of haunt me is, is, is just the notion that it, it's something that I didn't have and, and will never have. Um, so, yeah. I like those questions. I want them to guide me and I never want them answered. Um, I think that the life work of a writer to have questions that live and haunt you your whole life Absolutely. Um, it's that's beautiful that's beautiful thank you there's there's another question for you um are you are you thinking about your future readers 
at the moment of writing? Um, are they already present for you? Uh, what do you think of that? Um, I don't want that pressure. I want, you know, I don't want anyone to expect anything from me. I want to be able to make a mess, to make mistakes, to fail over and over, um, to get things wrong. Um, that's what I want from a future reader, um, to always be new to them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, for me, I think, um, I think when I'm writing poems, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm aware that there could be a point where someone else will read the poem at some, you know, but, but I think for me, um, you know, I, I want to encourage myself to write the poems that I want to read or that I'd like to see in this world. And so that encourages me to be my first, the first member of my audience is always going to be me, you know? And so not, not to say that I'm not thinking about readers and, uh, but, but, but it is to say that, you know, um, you know, writers often feel that pressure to write for a particular audience and, and it's so important that the writer can be at a place where they acknowledge that the first person they should try and make happy is themselves, right? And that that they that they're happy with the poem, or that that the, the poem has reached a point where it's content with them. Um, and so, and then the audience will come later, right? The audience will always come in at some point and get a chance to take part in the work. Um, but ultimately, it's about sort of the the, the writer being able to to sort of create something in which in which you know speaks to what they want to achieve in that piece first and foremost yeah thank you um i'd like to maybe invite the translators to uh just before they go i'd love to know more about their experience in translating um suvan kam and my Dare's work and words and maybe we can end with a very short reading. Maxi, uh, Mark, if you have to go, maybe um, don't worry. You can you can let me know which part you want to read. I can always take over. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> go ahead. Merci, uh, merci, Yara. Je um, je ferai ça un peu en anglais, en français. <laughs> ça vous va? Uh, yeah, I, I think I've I've told my dad a few. I mean, we've met over. Uh, we actually met some quite some time ago. I had we met the first time for about um, four or five hours. I had I don't know how many questions, and and we did meet uh, a few times even up to the end because uh, I still had uh, questions. Um, I've you know some of you know that. Um, this has been the most difficult text that I've translated. Uh, and I've, I, you know, I, I, I've said to my dad that um, it's, it, it, this has been a, a tremendous experience. Um, C'est vraiment un, un texte uh, où les images, uh, où les images choquent ou enfin uh, étonnent. Uh, Et je pense que dans une conversation qu'on a eue euh, ensemble, c'est Souvan Kam qui disait que ce qui est étonnant dans la poésie de, de Maider, c'est que on attend, le lecteur se forme peut-être une esprit de ce que pourrait être le mot suivant, et on est toujours dérouté, et de pouvoir reproduire cet effet constant d'étonnement, de surprise, de choc, euh, d'image inattendue. Euh, C'est, c'est, à vrai dire, extrêmement, euh, extrêmement exigeant, mais extrêmement euh, enrichissant. Et donc, euh, euh, ça a été une, ça a été une, euh, une expérience euh, difficile, mais extraordinaire. Et euh, c'est avec beaucoup de, comment dire, avec, euh, j'attends, <rire> j'attends de lire le nouveau recueil de, de Maïda avec... Euh, Enfin, avec, c'est vraiment, j'attends beaucoup cela dans les, dans les prochaines semaines et dans les prochains mois. Pero? Uh, okay, so uh, I can try to say it in English. Um, so what uh, Marc is uh, saying about the surprise, 
um, of the next word, you know, uh, in uh, the poems of uh, Medev Medervang. Um, I think we have that surprise in uh, Suvankam, your uh, stories, not because uh, the stories end up in such a, a big, you know, uh, a big event and, and uh, surprise, but the surprises, the stories just end up being so uh, down to earth and so simple that it gives a nice surprise to, to the reader and the translator. Uh, and for me, this book was so uh, delicious to, to translate because of it, there's a lot of play on actual language. So, so it becomes for the, um, for the French, uh, I don't want to invent something in French. I want to leave it to, mm -hmm. to describe in French what is going on in the English language, um, especially in the first story. So it was uh, uh, like a puzzle to me. And uh, yeah, I really loved to translate I it. I read it in French and what is so absurdly clear is that comes across that maybe I couldn't quite do because I was working in the English language is the resentment of, for the English language and also the curiosity and the wonder and the love of language. You, you make that so clear um, and you can hear it and see it um, in the French. Whereas because I'm doing it in English, it's kind of like, uh, I do it knowingly. Um, you know, I'm making fun of the English language with the English language, but when it's in French, that making fun of um, is, is so hilarious. And like you really capture that that humor um, that maybe isn't always or is often um, projected onto my stories as sadness. Like these stories are not sad. They to me they are full of humor and joy. And and you bring that out in the French language so well. Thank you. Thank you. May May I just say that the ending of Picking Worms is the most awesome ending I have ever read to any short story <laughs> with the most satisfying ending. I mean, any any girl <laughs> who's lived this good experience. <laughs> so thank you so much, um, Suvan Kam, for bringing these, these characters to life. And um, thank you, my dear. I have to say, reading you, my dear, has been really I, it, it just it, it, it makes you grow as you read it. It's it's a it's very touching to me. I'm someone who reads. Uh, everyone knows I'm a big reader of Mahmoud Darwish, who was a famous Palestinian uh, poet. And uh, as I read you, I, 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 I felt that kind of voice that goes beyond, beyond actually frontiers, beyond backgrounds, and touches upon a universal experience of anyone who's lived uprootment. So I wanted to thank you both for that. And um, I really do hope everyone discovers your beautiful books in French. We're working hard on that. And I think they're finding their audience. So thank you for taking this time with us. Um, I wonder, we have one minute left. I know that Mark has to go, but would you like, uh, would you like to maybe take two or three minutes and read one last excerpt to end with poetry and with, with literature? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll read the English of um, how to, the ending of how to pronounce nice. At the end of the school day, Miss Choi was waiting for her by the door. She asked the child to follow her to the front desk where she unlocked the top drawer and pulled out the red velvet sack. Pick one, she said, and the child reached inside and grabbed at the first thing her fingers touched. It was a puzzle with an airplane in the sky. When she shows her father the prize, he is delighted because in some way he has won it too. They take the prize, all the little pieces of it and start forming the edge, the blue sky, the other pieces, the middle, the whole picture, they fill those in later. Thank you.
Euh, Véronique, est-ce que tu veux lire en français Vas-y. D'accord. À la sortie des classes, Miss Joy l'attendait près de la porte. Elle pressa l'enfant de la suivre à son bureau, déverrouilla le tiroir du haut et sortit le sac de velours rouge. « Choisis-en un, » dit-elle. Et l'enfant tendit la main et saisit la première chose que ses doigts touchèrent. C'était un puzzle, un avion dans le ciel. Lorsqu'elle montre le prix à son père, il est ravi, car, d'une certaine manière, il a gagné aussi. Ils prennent le prix, toutes ces petites pièces, et commencent à former le contour, le ciel bleu, les autres pièces, le sang. L'ensemble, ils le compléteront plus tard. Merci beaucoup. My dear, would you like to end this on a beautiful poetic note for us? Yeah, sure. So um, I think I'll just do one poem. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, when the mountains rose beneath us, we became the valley. I won't ask why the Sala came to you, father, or of the poacher who followed. But I ask of the country you lost, the one I never had, unlike the midwife who sketched birth maps on a girl's body and found a rainforest in her belly. I ask why a body is born to save money, but can't pay to cross hell's ferry, or why snow tells us heaven is cold. A sunken missile rep maddens radiant as firework to the eyes of a tribesman, witnessing for the first time. How did an ancient boy drown in a homeless river? I ask why the war sick warrior who hunts with claws is hiding a poem. A piece of paper hides a garden. What harrowed you most arriving at the last minute to catch your brother's final breath on the hospital bed? Can a unicorn kindle the night haloed by its flame, torches jutting from its head? Live on, ask me how I've saved us. Ask me to build our temples so rooted, so stone. We won't ever die out. Thank you all so much. Marc, as-tu le temps? Je, je t'entends pas, Marc. Il faut enlever ton micro. Allume ton micro. Allez, c'est bon? Oui, vas-y. Oui, oui, oui. J'ai envoyé un message que, en leur disant que j'allais être deux minutes en retard, je vous le dis. Mais je quitte. Super. Alors, quand les montagnes se sont levées sous nos pieds, nous en sommes devenus la vallée. Je préfère ne pas demander pourquoi le Saola est allé vers toi, père, ni pourquoi le braconnier a suivi, mais je demande de connaître ce pays que tu as perdu, celui que je n'ai jamais eu, pas comme la sage-femme qui a dessiné des cartes de naissance sur le corps d'une jeune femme et trouvé une forêt vierge dans son ventre. Je demande pourquoi un corps né pour épargner n'a pas de quoi payer pour traverser l'enfer, ou pourquoi la neige nous apprend qu'au paradis, il fait froid. Un missile enfoui rage de radiance, tel un feu d'artifice aux yeux d'une tribu qui l'observe pour, pour la toute première fois. Comment un garçon d'autrefois s'est-il noyé dans une rivière sans nom? Je demande pourquoi le guerrier, là de la guerre, armé de ses griffes, cache un poème, un bout de papier dissimulant un jardin entier. Te demande ce qui t'angoissait le plus arrivant à la dernière minute à l'hôpital, juste à temps pour témoigner du dernier souffle de ton frère. La licorne peut-elle réchauffer la nuit, sa lumière formant un halo, des flambeaux saillant de sa tête? Continue de vivre. Demande-moi comment je nous ai sauvés. Demande-moi d'enraciner nos temples dans la pierre, de sorte que nous ne mourrons jamais. Merci. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Souvan Kam, Tamavongsa. Merci, Mai Dervang. Thank you so much for being with us. Merci à tout le monde d'avoir passé avec nous votre lunch. Les livres sont en librairie. Allez voir votre libraire. Et le, le, la rencontre sera aussi enregistrée. Donc, vous pouvez aller l'écouter plus tard également. Thank you so much, everyone.